Uh, we, we are going to try to have a, a reasonable talk about, about the topic. I don't think any of us plan to, to get to any conclusions, but the goal here is to get through a couple of people's initial statements and then get into a Q&A uh, uh, mode with all of you uh, for the rest of the session. So, Devin, why don't you start? I also built in some exercise for the, for the panel. Um, so in terms of sort of talking about data segmentation for privacy, I, I, I always want to sort of start the conversation by sort of grounding um, why we have sensitive data laws to begin with. Um, and, and data segmentation really reveals to, um, to I think, tools that enable a provider to um, share some information about a patient, but withhold some that might be subject to more stringent privacy rules because of its perceived higher level of sensitivity. So you know, for example, that HIPAA allows for any data to be shared for treatment uh, purposes without needing to get the patient's consent. And HIPAA really only treats one category of data as particularly sensitive, and that's psychotherapy notes. And frankly, even the patient is not allowed to get those. So they're, they're treated with heightened sensitivity in HIPAA, but beyond that, HIPAA sort of treats all data as being equally sensitive. But Congress, in authorizing the HIPAA rules, also said that HIPAA would not be the ceiling for privacy, and that states and frankly, other federal laws could create more stringent privacy rules. You can't fall below, but you can go above HIPAA. And so as, as a result, we have some federal laws that actually create heightened privacy rules around health data. Uh, and you will find them in the regulations governing uh, federally funded substance abuse treatment facilities or programs uh, with respect to data that identifies or has the potential to identify someone as a substance abuser. Those are very stringent rules that apply at a federal level, but only to specific programs. And then FERPA, the federal education um, rules around student privacy. And so that would apply to student health centers with respect to health data. Those are also more stringent. My understanding is that the Veterans Administration also has a set of rules that are more stringent with respect to uh, VA health data. Uh, I'm really less familiar with those. And then states, frankly, have enacted some particular privacy rules that create heightened protections. And, and many of the, um, of the categories of data are similar, although the particular aspects of the laws are not similar. Mental health data is, uh, is actually regulated in some way, shape, or form by almost all states, except Alabama. And now Hawaii had particular rules in mental health that they recently floated all their laws down to HIPAA, which is always an option for a state to do, but the state has to make that decision to do so. Um, genetic information is sometimes treated by um, special laws. There is, of course, GINA with respect to the ability to use genetic information for discrimination purposes. Um, and then, you know, sub there's, there are also rules around uh, STD data, reproductive health data, uh, uh, data indicating domestic violence, so there's a lot that's out there, and, and, I, and the reason for these laws is not to drive doctors crazy, right? Because I understand why providers want all of the data that could be relevant about a patient's health in order to deliver good quality of care to that patient. But the reason why these laws exist is so that patients feel comfortable coming in for care for a sensitive condition where those additional guarantees of confidentiality might keep them from doing that. If you have a substance abuse problem that you're being treated for, the ability to get yourself into treatment may depend on trusting that that data is not going to haunt you and be seen by everyone who takes care of you, and plus other people, for the rest of your life. Similarly, with respect to uh, minors, issues uh, that, um, in terms of sort of whether they're parents, are automatically told or have the ability to find out about their care may prevent some of them from going in and getting the care that they need. And that's the reason why a number of states have enabled minors to consent 
to certain uh, treatments without necessarily needing their parents' consent. And when that happens, they hold the privacy right in terms of the ability to share that data. It is not intended to undermine the ability of parents to know what's going on with their teenagers. It is intended to protect the teenagers and their ability to seek confidential care when their likelihood that they would do so may be lessened if those guarantees of confidentiality or some assurances of confidentiality could not be provided. And that's why they exist. The challenge, of course, is that this was all a lot easier to comply with when we kept records in paper. Because you could use whiteout, <laughs> or you could redact records, or you could just not send things by fax, or you could just not send anything at all, right? And, but that it's, it's a lot more difficult in a, in, a, in a digital environment, and especially where we've organized our systems around the sharing of, of sort of documents that are populated with lots of different pieces of data where it might not be that easy to pull it out. I think the other thing that complicates this is that notwithstanding that providers have always had to operate on whatever information a patient gives them, however incomplete it might be, verbally conveyed in an office visit or in an emergency room or at a hospital, there, there is a sort of higher expectation about the validity and truth of digital data and the ability to sort of access a more complete record through information exchange that somehow has ratcheted this conversation up to data that, it, that is withheld in a digital context will somehow subject the physician to a greater amount of liability than would have other, otherwise been the case. I'm, I'm not sure how valid that concern is in terms of sort of how malpractice law uh, generally works or is supposed to work from a legal context, but the fact that those concerns exist is something that we do have to confront and address. And frankly, my, my concern is that our inability to sort of crack this nut and figure out how to deal with this to date means that we're leaving sensitive information out of information exchange in order to avoid the difficulties. And so, you know, most uh, HIEs that I've talked to do not accept uh, substance abuse treatment data. Uh, minors data frequently left out of HIEs. Even in circumstances where the patient, if asked, might in fact say yes. And we asked, we actually had a hearing um, on uh, technologies for protecting sensitive data um, as part of our policy committee work. And I distinctly remember a question being asked to one of the uh, vendors who performs some form of data segmentation uh, for mostly um, part two providers, so substance abuse treatment providers, about how, how frequently patients do withhold data. And the fact is, is that most of the patients say yes that they want to exchange at like the 80% level, even substance abuse treatment data, which certainly if I were in that situation, I probably might be, again, I'm a privacy advocate, the one who says no. But 80% of people say yes because they understand the value of that. Um, and yet we're deciding just not to exchange it. We're not even asking them. Where's the liability risk in that, I guess, is a question that's, that's worth asking. So since we don't have a lot of time for this panel, um, I do have some slides that contain some recommendations that came out of the National Committee on Vital and Health Statistics about how to deal with sensitive data that call for the creation of specific categories well-defined about what, sense, what constitutes sensitive data and, and, and to call for testing of technologies to protect data in those categories to try to place some sort of uh, more clear categories around it, because I think part of the challenge is that the laws all read very differently, and they're not even all that well understood within the states where they apply. So there's often, there's a, a really a whole lot of work to do, even if you accept the, the premise that we do need to give people greater control over sensitive data in creating mechanisms that will actually allow that to be honored, and then being quite honest with patients about what those capacities are and what their limitations are. So if we need to use those slides to refer to the NCBHS recommendations, we have them. But rather than, than go through all of them, I want to give opportunities for the others to talk. So uh, the work, policy work that, that Devin described um, has been reflected 
by an activity in the SNI framework in, of, of ONC um, for data segment under the acronym DS4P, Data Segmentation for Privacy. Uh, and uh, it's about sequestering from capture, access, or view certain data elements. This is a definition that comes out of the, the stuff that, that uh, Devin described. Uh, and she's, I think, listed the, the different requirements. Uh, the way it's described in DS4P is that the sending system has to identify information, which is restricted, which they have to do anyways, uh, verify the, the, the patient's privacy consent, and add privacy metadata to the data that's sent. And then the receiving system has to process the metadata and essentially keep track of whether the data is restricted or not, remembering that it's not always what data it is, it's sometimes who it came from that determines whether it's restricted. Uh, now, in, you know, in, the, in the manual days, you just took that report and you put it in a separate cabinet and you put a lock on that cabinet and, and you were done. And there is an EHR implementation of that. It's effectively segregating that report, not introducing that data into the structured data of the EHR, and therefore losing the benefit of, of whatever assistance and treatment and, and, uh, might come from the EHR having access to the data. Um, and that, of course, is considered uh, less useful than, than somehow being able to track that path from the report to the structured data elements uh, in the report. So uh, essentially there are two technical approaches. Uh, the reports are sequestered or the individual data items are sequestered. And a lot of the concern in the industry is about the assumption that it is straightforward, inexpensive, and easily accomplished uh, to track within the HIE or within the EHR data after it's been uh, uh, taken out of the, shredded out of, out of the composite document and then reconstituted as data elements in a, in a, in a single record about the patient. Um, the current status of, of that second approach with meaningful use is that, as far as I know, nothing is announced, Devin. Yeah. Um, the SNI framework includes, if you go to the wiki and you download the work there, it includes sec sequestration by data item. And it includes a project that they've spawned with HL7 to modify various of its standards to support sequestration by data item. They, they report five pilots going on uh, and uh, I believe, and I have to admit this is on less than full, full examination of the data, I believe that most or all of the pilots are actually doing sequestration by document. That is, the, the notion that sequestration by data item is being proven now in pilots is an uh, uh, incorrect assumption that would be easy to draw from the materials that are available. Uh, the, 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 some, of, some of the other issues, there's a kind of a kabuki dance around, around consent. Well, here's the consent I have. What consent do you need? Well, can I get you that consent? Uh, you know, just, just the mechanics of, and this is whether it's documentation or, or individual data, it's just the mechanics of doing that and the time spent with patients trying to explain to them 
how they might consent on individual data items <laughs> has led to the notion that there's a new job category that we need in healthcare delivery organizations, which is a data privacy counselor. Uh, the the uh, I think I've covered most of most of the of the issues here in in, uh, in fewer words. So uh, at this point, I'm going to describe my own impression. Now I'm going from reporting what's what's supposedly what's probably facts to what I think. Um, is that this could play out three ways in a regulatory basis, the whimper, the bang, and the miracle. Um, the whimper is that it's just sort of gradually, the, the, the SNI proposal just sort of gradually fades, never comes out in a regulation, and we implement, as we go through our various kinds of interoperability, we implement something that's very close to the paper practice now, just to, to be responsive, but no, no uniform approach. Um, the second is that the, there is enough lobbying on, on both sides to create a regulation um, that requires uh, sequestration by data, by, by data elements. Um, and I would, the, the last time I saw a regulation that I think had the impact of that was the accounting for disclosure regulation, which uh, as we heard today is, is going to be rethought before it comes out in final thing. Um, and then the miracle uh, would be that, that we actually find through these pilots that, that, and more pilots that it's really possible to implement this in a way that, that Patients are not overwhelmed making consent. And by the way, do patients have the ability to revoke their consent, Devin? I guess it depends on the law, right? But most of those are prospective in nature. You can't go back and okay. undo right. what's right. already right. been exchanged. Okay. Right. Yeah. And um, that, that uh, uh, over some period of time, reasonable amount of time for something like this to develop, like say stage four, uh, uh, we see nominal compliance and we're able to, to go to, to more compliance in the future. So I, I actually think those are the only possible outcomes to the, just the physics of all of the issues involved. But, but others, other speakers may have different views. I think Chris was going to speak basically on the provider's view. Is that right? And I'll be very brief. Obviously, my comments reflect personal opinion, not Mayo Clinic, the usual thing. Um, but first of all, I think you picked up this morning that I'm actually a mad scientist that wants to analyze uh, you know, large amounts of patient data, so I think patient data access is good for you. However, that being said, I also, and many of my colleagues, all of my colleagues, also firmly believe in the advantages of privacy and in the advantages of patient engagement, patient partnership, patient understanding. We all want to act ethically. We all want to manage patient information in trust and in confidence. That being said, the issue of partitioning is perhaps a red herring. Because if we're genuine about this dialogue with patients, there are two factors with patient data partitioning for privacy that come to the fore. One is feasibility. I mean, you don't need to think about this very long. That if you want to partition a data element, most data elements are all over the darn place. There's laboratory data that can imply your AIDS diagnosis. There's medication data that can imply your AIDS diagnosis. There's uh, you know, notes and comments strewn throughout the, the dictations and, and, and uh, other annotations in the chart that can imply that diagnosis. And it's not just that diagnosis. You can replay that scenario for virtually any clinical data element that you might want to sequester. So is it feasible? And can we, in, a, in an honest dialogue with patients, with a straight face, say, yes, we can partition this data in a way that would not violate your confidence? Uh, some of us believe that is simply not possible on the face of it, and we shouldn't even try. The second point is safety. We as providers, we as society, 
have an obligation to ensure the safety of the healthcare process and safety to patients. You don't need to think about this very long before it's not hard to anticipate circumstances where sequestering information could be very dangerous to the patient. And if you're not telling somebody that you're on, you know, AIDS medications or something like that, that can have huge physiologic impacts on drug metabolism, on disease history, on obviously immune sensitivity and so on and so forth, is that a safe thing to do? So again, if you're going to be honest with the patient, I mean, privacy is good, but partitioning is probably the worst of all possible approaches to get there. And in the, the, the intention to be honest and respectful of patient rights and privacy, I think there are many strategies that we can take that are more straightforward, practical, feasible, and safe than partition. My comments don't reflect uh, any organization's opinions. They don't even reflect mine. I'm actually channeling the voices in my head from the Aztec sun gods. Okay? <laughs> and these voices are telling me that I might be crazy, that I've had a number of substance abuse encounters, uh, all due to the proximity of the espresso shop down the street. And my biggest concern is I would lose my employment. I mean, that's why people really worry about this. I mean, because we have this employment-based healthcare system. And, you, you know, you worry about your job, my uh, criminal record. I don't want that revealed, you know, charges were dropped. But the point is, we've all got secrets. We've all got stuff. But I question a whole bunch of things. I love attribute-based encryption and metadata and meta-metadata and all of these things. But before we go down that road, and I think we ought to, two things. One is... Let's not, again, uh, enforce a policy when we don't understand it. I mean, I'm here, I heard the word ICD-11 today. Uh, I heard meaningful use four. Um, I'm, th you know, I kind of want ICD-2, you know, and, and I just like to have simple stuff and, and make sure that works. I ask you the following. What is the evidence that the paper-based privacy policies, which I've studied in great length, every state is different, are being enforced well by anyone. How do we know? How do we know if uh, Maryland says y your mental health is certain mental uh, procedures and in Tennessee it's facilities and the federals of psychiatric notes? How do we know, as Devin says, that people have any idea? And since we don't really have any systematic audit logs, we have some occasional breaches, how do we know the paper-based system worked? So then we took that and we amplified times 10 and then we try to automate something that we don't know that works. And of course, there's this whole issue that I think others want to talk about, and that is that if you send me a message, a document, great, but as soon as I write a problem list, game over, right? Because obviously I do. As soon as I dictate a radiology report, if I've got a schizophrenic who's got all kinds of metallic objects in your stomach, it's either a schizophrenic or somebody's had a horrible crime done to them. You know? But the point is, people put in the dictated notes and all, all kinds of stuff. So to me, it's inconsistent, it's a noble cause, it's gonna take a lot longer time than our policymakers would want, and the only options are to drop off the grid if you have some issue, or perhaps create a medical record that is just like medical record light, that only allows certain codes, only allows certain phrases, blocks out everything else, and you just say, this is a different kind of medical utterance here, it's an incomplete picture, and I've signed up for you know, medical record light. I don't know if any, I don't know what good that would be. I share all of Chris's uh, uh, clinical concerns, but Which I'm just, bad, yeah. and, it's, and, and I'm just saying that as soon as you see a good physician and they dictate a history and physical, any notion of blocking out that history, if they're a good physician, should be gone unless you go back and decompose that note as well. So we have a million different practical problems to address. They're important problems, but Again, I, I just fear a great deal that we're getting out ahead of ourselves and trying to enforce stuff that we do not understand. I do, but I've seen Mark giving up the mic. <laughs> well, I, it, it, it is the case that most of these laws were created uh, well before we digitized health information. Um, but I'm not willing to throw people with data sensitivity concerns into the skim milk electronic medical record option only. <laughs> um, to borrow a phrase that I've now borrowed several times from Justice Ginsburg. Um, I, you know, I, I, I think if our goal is sort of the absolute protection of this data, then, then we're already done because the leakage problem is clearly there. 
But if we can do a reasonably good job of saying that visit to the Planned Parenthood clinic that you had when you were 14, we're going to let you hold that back from being disclosed outside of that context. That, you know, the records of the mental health care provider that you see weekly, medications is another story that we do need to talk about from a, from a safety standpoint. But the, but the notes and, 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 and information that might not necessarily be relevant to your physical care from that provider, we're going to hold that back. But if you talk about that with your primary care physician and it ends up in her note, we can't necessarily give you those kinds of guarantees. I mean, I, I, I don't think that an all or nothing approach to this is the way to go. I think we look at what we can do. What was, what, what was on the t-shirt? Mediocrity? <laughs> I, I was just going to raise one other issue that I don't think anybody's brought up yet, which is the issue around mandatory reporting, whether it's to uh, registries or to uh, law enforcement, for example, and the principles of justice that would apply. So things like, well, gee, I don't want people to know that I chose not to have my children immunized and that I was the cause of the typhoid outbreak in our school. Uh, <laughs> uh, no, well, I mean, it's yeah. sort of an extreme example, but I mean, there's, you can imagine many issues around cancer registry reporting, around uh, reporting to law enforcement of spousal abuse. What do you do when the patient has said no? Uh, and and I, I mean, there's an answer to that, I think, but it's just another dimension I don't think we've talked about. Well, and you know, what's interesting is that it's often the public reporting laws that are the reason why some of these sensitive data laws get passed mm -hmm. in the first place, right? The need to be able to routinely collect this for public health reasons causes policymakers to try to create additional privacy protections around it, again, to avoid creating a situation where the public reporting laws force people into hiding and then they don't go get care. And just so you know, I'm, I was just trying to be provocative, obviously. But you did a damn good thank job. Thank you. I know I set you off. Um, but, but to me, we have to do a number of experiments and see what works and what doesn't. We, there's, I can think of a thousand different things we can do along the spirits of what New York and California are doing about how different approaches really do meet the intended outcome. So you start with the intended outcomes, and you see which techniques work and which do not. You know. There's Bayesian techniques you do for medication lists. There's a million different ways you can filter. I think what we're not doing is taking pilots and collectively doing the informatics research, combining it with policy and in a sense do a broader kind of engineered approach to learn what's going on. And I'm arguing that's what we have to do right now and not hope that we can solve it via global policy decision, just draw a very broad umbrella. And then let's just very systematically work through for the next few years and see what works and what doesn't in this new world. That's all I'm marking. Mm -hmm. one, one other thing I wanted, when Will asked me if I'd come and sit at the table up here, I was more than happy to say yes, because I'm not encumbered by facts or knowledge about this topic at all. <laughs> um, but I, I was struck, one of the things, when I was working for a big boat company and we were doing NHIN 1 way back in the old days, one of the things that we decided we'd take on is we'd really do granular consent. And the approach that we'd taken to things is that we took information coming in, we transformed it all into a canonical model that we could hold on to for a while, and then we'd transform it into whatever message it needed to be to get moved on. And the fact that it was in this model meant that we could sequester potential information based on very granular consent that we would allow a patient or, or, or whatever to do. Um, we built that, it worked, so what we showed is that you could do it technically and we all looked at it and thought, oh my God, what have we done? Because what we did was we created something that was technically possible and completely unworkable in the real world. And I don't know if it is bang or it's something between bang and miserable, and miserable, <laughs> miracle. <laughs> miserable is right, where, where technically you can show that you can do it, but operationally it just doesn't work at all. That, that experience actually forced me into a public apology at Connecting for Health uh, because of what we had brought up and showed was technically possible but was a really, really bad idea. And all, all, I, all I, I, I would hate to see us move something forward because it was the right thing to do, create a monster that was unworkable even though technically possible, and everyone would refuse to do it and we'd be right where we are now where we do have sequestration sequestration because HIEs refuse to deal with the data at all because it's just 
too operationally it's too hard. <laughs> Agreed. At the risk of putting words in Devin's mouth and being sure that she'll correct me, um, I I heard her talk about an approach that was uh, very very technologically limited. It carried none of the none of the complications associated with, with, with what Rim was describing. And I think, frankly, um, the effort that, that Rim says he apologized for continues to live in, in, the, in the wikis of, of, of modern technology standards, um, so it's a concern. But, but she said, if the data, if the, and I, I interpret it as the report, is is restricted, doesn't have the, the necessary consent, you don't you, you sequester it. You don't you don't make it a part of the part of the record. Um, if someone talks to the patient, finds the same information and puts it in, in the record, and that action was not was not is not restricted by law. Then you don't sequester. Uh, and where we need clarification on the policy level is, if you got the data through a through a privileged source and you also got the data directly, does it become sequestered because you got it through a privilege a privileged source? Um, but, but, you know, right now, these laws are in place. We have to do something and, you know, consistent with our discussion on simplicity versus shiny objects, I, I, I didn't think that, that what she, she suggested was, was uh, um, out of bounds with what could be done. You weren't wrong in, in what I said, although I, I will say that I am very interested in hearing what happens as part of these pilots. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, because, and I do agree, actually, that just because something is technically possible in sort of a, uh, a, a lab setting doesn't necessarily mean that it will work in a workflow setting and that ideally when you're pilot testing something you're actually doing that in real world conditions, right? So pressure testing the idea that we technically can or cannot do this in real world settings is absolutely worth doing. So then we can understand what's capable and what's not. And, and then I think we do need to have the, the, the more robust conversations about what do the policies currently say and in what ways do they not sort of fit with what we can technically do today? And to what extent do they not address the concerns that Chris so eloquently raised about safety? You know, one of the things that, that also may be operating here um, is similar to the one I raised this morning with respect to the HIPAA myths, which is that people assume that a sensitive data law on mental health data covers more and restricts more yeah, than in fact right. it does. Because yeah. I took a look at the, um, some of the California laws on mental health data um, shortly before I came here and there's treatment exception in there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if you're using it for treatment purposes, you actually can use it for treatment purposes. It sort of gets treated similar to HIPAA. The definition of mental health record is a little broad, so it's a little unclear what it applies to, but generally if you're using it for treatment, you don't, that's not the concern. I, I think, you know, to some, and, and also the part two data can be accessible in a medical emergency for somebody, and that includes the medication issues. So in some respects, I think it, we, we still have issues to deal with. I'm not suggesting that we don't, but in some respects, the myth of the issues is bigger, may be bigger than the actual issues. And given that there's a lot of uncertainty about how these laws uh, are interpreted and what they really mean, even by people who live within the states where those laws apply, and I do think it is the case that they haven't really been aggressively enforced because there wasn't necessarily a need to do so in a non-digital environment, that we have some work to do. It's sort of dusting those things off, understanding what they mean, 
and, and you know, so figuring out with the greater technical knowledge about what we can and can't do. And then creating a set of expectations among patients about what, what in fact can be protected and shielded from view and what in fact cannot be. Could I propose something then? I mean, we, we've heard about some very innovative communities, um, California, New York, Chris's stuff. Let's assume, for example, Chris's beacon. We, we know that the uh, worst case assumptions about these laws is a pretty scary thing to people. But we know that we want to discover this. So should some groups be really given a safe harbor and say, look, you know, try to do these basic things that Stefan recommended and try different solutions and see what it is. Again, I'm just trying to argue back to trying to get more evidence, more data, more talking to consumers with different test scenarios and stuff to really see where that slippery slope really means something to characterize patients and then engineer it up front. So we start with the basics, but we, we, we stop the fear by just granting certain groups safe harbor to kind of evaluate these things more systematically. Just an idea. So, Will, do you want to do you want to take questions, or are we are kind of off, off the clock now? We're we're pretty uh, we're running a, a little over time here, but I want to know if there are any questions anyone wants to pose to the panel. Walter. I think it's a reasonable explanation of, of history upon which we don't have a whole lot of hard data. In other words, yes, these laws have existed for a very long time. So it's not like we didn't know they existed when we built these systems, right? But I think that now the prospect of, of sort of automation and HIEs has sort of driven, driven us to the point where now we realize we have to have a solution. Yet the, the laws are not going away anytime soon. I think we have to solve them from a technical point of view to the best that we can. And we, we may not be able to, in fact, 
fully automate, but I don't like, right now the solution is leave it out, mm -hmm. right? And that just doesn't seem like the right solution to me. Well, exactly, and so I understand why people are leaving it out. Don't get me wrong, but it's a but, but it's a pretty crappy solution. Yeah. So so what so what I hear is that we have laws, we have a crappy solution. It's what people are doing. If your question is how can you implement an HIE or some other exchange? Given the laws, the answer is clear. Use the crappy solution. The, the rest of that is we need more research. We need more understanding. We need, we need to really figure out what, what we can do. But we need to avoid uh, a technologically uh, interesting solution until we know more about what, what's going on. Uh, I want to take this other comment from the, the over here, but but I just want to make sure anybody else has something they want to say. Okay, go ahead. So. Oh, over here. Yeah. Sorry. Well, you go ahead. You can see no, both ways. Lark, there, there, there. Um, so one of the things that I'm struggling with is that the underlying assumption that I don't think is actually being said is the reason this is hard is because we don't actually capture data that's associated with solving the problem we're trying to solve. So, you know, I mean, if we could influence the EHR vendors to create a step-by-step -step solution where first we started tagging encounters with the possible contexts, they might have a context of mental health or they might have a, it just seems to me that if we try to boil the ocean down at the data element level, before we actually have the data elements to, to measure against or that we know they're going in a particular place in a record, that you have a little bit of a challenge. So it seems to me, and then the second thing is, I'm, forget that, the second thing is, is you know, on cigarette packages and other things, there's actually a Surgeon General's warning. Why couldn't we have a Surgeon General's warning that gets said to the person when they log in for their, when they walk in and register for their encounter with a clinician that says, you know, we don't recommend you do this. It'll be harmful to your health. Don't, you know, don't sequester your data. And then <coughs> check a box or don't check a box. I mean, I, I'm struggling with the complexity of, we, we don't have a good way to address privacy in general. And so it seems like going straight to data segmentation when we don't we can't even describe the data that we're trying to segment it just seems like there's a missing step and i'm just interested if anybody else sees that but well, i think that that is one of the things that is uh gets partly at rim's comment that Technologically, you could imagine ways to do it, but pragmatically, the ability for either a patient to say on a data element by data element basis, here's what I care, and, and you could give that surgeon general warning in general or about a specific thing. Uh, and so these categories of data that Devin mentioned might help, um, although it's going to be interesting to see if you can draw a box that balances, because I think at the end of the day, you're still balancing the uh, autonomy of the patient and control of the patient with sort of beneficence and 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 our obligation to protect the patient from uh, what in some cases arguably their own ignorance or and, I, and so I think drawing those circles and categories in a way that is understood so that you could have the proper surgeon general's warning around them is part of the challenge and I, I don't think we right. know how to do that yeah and, and to the extent that there's a version of the Surgeon General's warning in operation today, it's basically people being told, if you don't like your sensitive data being shared in the HIE, you'd, then don't, you're opted out for the whole thing.
Um, okay, we're going to end with uh, John, but first. Thank you. Um, so I think what I'd like to say is, and to, to the comment here about what have we be, been doing, I can tell you, I've been looking working in the last 10 years as a privacy professional trying to get vendors to build technology in so I can detect what's happening. And unless it's a gener ge or revenue generator, I get a no. So I, I hear ACO flags about, you know, tell me if my patient goes into the ED at 2 o'clock on a Tuesday afternoon. I want to know as a doc. That's the exact same technology that tells me if somebody with the same last name looks up the record of somebody with their last name. So it's not, it's, it's, it's not a one, I think, all throughout the day, it's, been, it's not one thing that's going to solve it. But we have a, a reality as of September 23rd. Patients have a right to restrict if they pay in cash. Poop. I'd like to talk about poop. You know, I mean, this, what? how are we going to do that in HIE? Because we know, we think HIE is just being used for treatment. But I heard today lots of scenarios where it's, pay, it's payment, it's healthcare operations, it's population health. We want to use it for lots of different reasons. So the other factor here is not the data, just the data. It's what are we using it for? Mm -hmm. And patients care about, look, I'll let you use it for treatment. I'm OK with treatment. But if you've got a payer that has access to the HIE, then I want you to withhold the things they have no business seeing. So it, it's a it's a larger conversation. I guess I'm just I'm optimistic we can solve it. But you know this last panel, I I feel like wow. you know we should be. We, I want to continue to be optimistic. Yes. And I think with this group and all of the really interesting pilots we've seen, that I don't think we have the answer to it. But we got to still we got to keep trying. And that's what I think is really important for California, especially because we have so many uh, specialized types of information. So I, I appreciate the, the forum. John? If you hadn't recognized me by name, well, I'd have run and sat down uh, rather than speak. But I'm going to go. I want to ask a question. I'll give, hopefully, a, a few analogies that you can um, blame on the prior person who said something about boiling the ocean and don't associate it with my name. You know, so why does mankind boil the ocean? I think one good example is like Larry Ellison defending the America's Cup. He sets the rules and they do it in boats that only Larry Ellison can afford, so there's only one competent player. Um, so what, what relevance does this possibly have to health IT? Well, here, here's an example. Some of you might have ever met uh, Dick Mahoney, who sold MedPlus to Quest Diagnostics. And he once bought a boat, and I think this is a good analogy. It was over 100 feet long when he bought it after selling a prior non-health IT company. It was the sixth largest private boat in America. He owned it a few years, sold it later at a time when everyone was making money, and he sold like not even the 300th largest private boat in America. And isn't that what health IT has become? where we've allowed it to become far too complex. And aren't, aren't what we're going to have to do to make things comprehensible on a human scale to patient, to define a, a pond where everyone's sailing around in a nine-foot dinghy? And even if you're Larry Ellison sailing a $70 million monstrosity, aren't we going to have to have a set of simple rules to where to the patient, I'm in a nine-foot dinghy and I make my nine-foot dinghy decision because, gosh golly, if we try to enable every patient to make a $70 million kind of decision, for people that are driving these health IT systems that are as complex as Larry Ellison's yacht, how is anyone going to make a request and how is anyone piloting one of those things going to know whether they honored any individual request or not? And it's going to have to be stripped down to simple. We're going to have to go away from the land of complexity. And I would give you the boiling the ocean person and Larry Ellison and his dang crazy catamaran as examples of how if we allow it to become as complex as the science allows it to be, We'll never manage it or govern it in our lifetime. So, thank you. All right. We, on that note, oh, I'll be quick. one more person. Okay, Oops. quick. I've, Run on late. I, I have to live and breathe these things every single day. My wife had come in on uh, weekends and spent about six hours dealing with uh, medical records and things like this. So there's, there's a couple things that I've I've done. First off, um, the power of mediocrity does apply to some extent. Most, almost all the medical records you can use as a file cabinet. So if we get a psychological report and it's got precious stuff in there, or just a psychological report, I have, I'll review the hard copy, and then we'll scan it and file it in a patient with last name Psych, and then 
last name, first name is the first name. So it is, it is completely separated from that medical record. Our um, Allscript system does have the ability to sequester it and require special access. I can't figure out how to do it, and I've already been shown twice. Yeah. So the um, user interface and the ability to do it simply is um, challenging. That's a very useful technique. You can use it for a lot of things. You could use it for STD. Or you could have it as last name privacy, and you could do that. One of the other things is you could advise your patients uh, when they come in, however you choose, that if there's certain sensitive things that are going to come up in the course of the exam, that um, you're happy to sequester it. And as physicians, we use cloaked terms all the time, HC for hepatitis C. Um, you know, immunis, uh, immun, immunity uh, concerns for HIV. So you can have um, kind of a, this uh, other matters were discussed separately with a few keywords and other doctors gonna kind of have a sense of, oh, okay. And then that can be parked separately because it's too easy uh, to have all the stuff just copied and sent out. I get subpoenas that come off Word documents from uh, attorneys that are often from the other side of my patient's car accident or something. No original signatures, nothing. Um, I called my malpractice carrier to go, what do I make out of this? I don't have anything on here. And I called the attorney and he's acting like uh, he's gonna send me to jail, sanction me, uh, if I don't release the records because he's an officer of the court. And I'm a physician trying to be smart in this system and I'm getting that kind of heat. Um, it's even harder for the administrators to stand up to this. So I talked to their counsel and he said, well, um, you could push it back to the attorneys to sort that out and get the patient to sign a consent form. So that worked well. The other thing I said was, am I on reasonable ground uh, to go to the judge if, it, if I get dragged in and say, this is why I was careful. We were looking to build an EHR system and the question was, what do I see as a physician is my most important job? And it was to walk, to bring the patient in the room and to close the door. That was the first thing. And I absolutely agree, as a good physician to write a complete history, you want a lot of stuff there. But we can code a few things if the patient wants us to. Hey, listen, we're better off in it all there. If it's uh, particularly sensitive, sure, we can kind of be brief here and then kind of handle it over there. So just a, the, the systems do have that kind of primitive file cabinet method of filing it over there, so it's a deliberate thing. This also comes down to, um, I would recommend that there be some sort of certification for health information released person. Because even as a physician, living and breathing this, and I actually read HIPAA, um, it's hard for me to figure this out. So it's going to be even harder for some medical assistant to even feel lucky that she got the record printed. Uh, and that's often the level of skill that we've got. Hey, you know, we've got to get this thing out. Um, I think those were the, uh, the, the key things that uh, I just wanted to put out. But at some point, for precious stuff, you got to have smart people that know what they're doing looking at it. And I think that is really what it comes down to here. And some tiered guidelines, some kind of relative damage control, some kind of this is what we're trying to do, but it's an imp imprecise system. And in the interest of giving a complete history, these things may get out, but we'll try and contain them. So some kind of guidelines and overview like that I think would be helpful. But a smart person with certification to deal with this stuff. I look at every medical record release that comes in my office. Um, thanks a lot. I, I was reminded um, of a cartoon that uh, Ken Mandel used in a presentation he gave uh, a few years ago. Um, you guys can't see it. It's uh, the doc is saying, whoa, way too much information. <laughs> So um, with that, I want to thank everyone for attending and our, our panelists and our presenters for um, a wonderful day. Robert, thank you.